Well, good evening. We are going to continue our uh, look at the book of the Revelation, um, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We call it uh, very often the, the revelation of John or uh, something like that, but it's the, uh, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing the unveiling, we get our uh, English word apocalypse that we typically think of for end time things from the um, from this word for revelation. And we're making a, well, a sort of a, uh, a change, a new section, we might say, and the concluding section uh, as we look at these last two chapters. Uh, Vance Havner once commented that he liked the... Uh, he liked the first two chapters and the last two chapters of the Bible because there's no uh, devil in the first two chapters and no devil in the last two chapters. So we're going to be looking at these last two chapters, and we're just going to look at the first four verses. Um, I tried to take verses one through eight as a uh, as a section, which I think they go together as a paragraph, and then the rest of chapter 21 will give us a description. We're going to be introduced to uh, introduced to the New Jerusalem tonight, but we will see its description in the remainder of chapter 21. So we'll look at that a little bit later. But if you have your Bibles, take God's Word and turn to the 21st chapter. That should be pretty easy to find. If you go all the way to the right, then come back left a few pages, you should get to this 21st chapter. Um, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and they sh there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for this time. We pray that you would bless us as we study your word. We pray that you would be glorified in this time, and we pray most of all that you would help us to see Jesus, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we come to chapter 21, we have seen, or through John, vicariously, as the Holy Spirit inspired him and gave him the vision to write. Uh, in chapter 1, we talked about John being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and the Spirit revealed to him uh, what to share with us. And we saw the glorified Christ. You remember John heard the voice from behind him and turned and saw the living Christ who was changed in such a way that he fell down as dead. And we saw in chapters two and three, Jesus' message to the churches and his presence there. John saw him in chapter one as that one walking between the lampstands or the candlesticks, uh, the churches. And we saw the message in chapters two and three. In chapters three and or chapters four and five, we saw God on the throne and Christ on the throne and those worshiping him around the throne, all of creation, all the redeemed of all the ages. And then in chapter six, we took a, a turn, really. Uh, we turned back to the earth. And after the, I believe, after the church is caught away, as in um, the Revelation, John says he was caught up or he was uh, told by the angel to come up here and he came up, and then we don't we have the churches mentioned a lot, and then we don't have the church mentioned at all uh through uh chapter six through nineteen, where we see evil and wickedness and judgment and wrath, and really the destruction of the earth and the death of the people of the earth and we see the rise of the most tyrannical government and religious system that will ever be in the earth. And then in chapter 20, we see the return of Christ. We see the thousand year 
reign of Christ. We see the greatest war of all time, the greatest death toll of all time. And then we see the greatest time of peace and prosperity that the world will ever know. And then there'll be another rebellion. We looked at that as hard as it is as that as that is to the belief. And now the scene changes. The beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet have been cast into hell. Satan has been cast into hell. Sinners who have rejected Christ have been condemned to hell. And now we start new. A new creation. Verse 1 says, John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. God is the God of creation. He is the one who stepped into time, if you will. Um, there was never a time when God was not, and in Genesis 1, the Bible tells us that he stepped into time in the beginning, whenever that was. In the beginning, God created out of nothing. He spoke into existence the universe as we know it today. Um, that word means to create out of nothing. And when he created it, it was good. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 4 and 10 and 12 and 18 and 21 and 25 and 31, God saw it and it was good. He is the God of the creation. He is the God of a new creation. Paul says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is, what, you know, a new creation. He makes us new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this new creation is not something that, uh, so we talked about this morning, progressive revelation. It's not something that God decided, oops, I got to fix this, so I'm going to have to do this. He knew all along, and he makes, he prophesied through the prophets in Isaiah 65 and 66. God says, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. In fact, he says, I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and it will be so good you won't even remember the old one. Now, that's the Shelby translation. The Bible says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. In Isaiah chapter 66, he says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. God knew all along he would make a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth. And in verses that we won't get to tonight, he tells us not only is there a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation, uh, he's going to make everything new in case he left it, anything out. Verse 5 tells us he makes he's going to make all things new. God promised in the past a new heaven and a new earth. And Peter says in his epistle in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, according to those promises, we look for it. We're looking for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Isn't that great that there'll be a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, so good that you won't even remember the old one. There are things I think maybe we might, we think anyway, we might like to remember. But think about that. Do you have past sins in your life that God has forgiven, but you can't forget? I believe in that new heaven and new earth, you'll be able to forget them. You won't even remember those old things. Do you have enemies in your life that you can't forget? You'll be able to forget them there. Do you have events in your past that you can't forget? God says through Isaiah, this new heaven and new earth will be so great the former things won't even come to mind. The new heaven and the new earth will be so grand that we won't be able to remember all of the old stuff. The old stuff is past. 
Behold, he makes all things new. A new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. Secondly, not only a new creation, but a new city, a new Jerusalem. John describes it as a bride prepared or adorned for her husband. That city is a city that's prepared, and that's what Jesus has told his disciples. He's, chapter 13 in John's gospel, he tells them that he is going to die. His hour has come. He's tried to show them to be a servant by washing their feet, by celebrating the Passover with them. And then in chapter 14, he says, don't really stop letting your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. There are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I'll come again, receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's wedding language. The the prospective groom would uh, pay the price for the bride and then he would tell her, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a room for us. And when I get that room finished, I'm going to come back and get you and take you to be with me and you can live with me at the father's house. And Jesus said, in my father's house, we're not adding one little room on. There's many rooms, many mansions, many dwelling places. You know, the bride uh, weddings, I think, uh, well, I know most men would admit, and I think most of the ladies would, that uh, brides and weddings are for the bride, not for the groom so much. Um, everybody's there to look at the bride. Dr. McGee said in his commentary, everybody's there to look at the bride except the mother of the groom, and she thinks her son is the best, and that may be true. But um, the bride prepares for the wedding. There are, in our day anyway, probably diets and dresses and showers and suggestions from others. There's relatives and relations that we deal with. Food and frustration. All this is to prepare the bride for a wedding. And that's what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it and cleanse it to prepare it. He says, by the washing of water, by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the picture of the new Jerusalem here. Holy and without blemish, washed by the water and the word, that we might be presented to Christ as that bride. As a pastor, I've got to be involved, uh, had the honor to be involved in several weddings. And there is nothing more special, I don't believe, in the wedding ceremony than the time when the bride is brought to meet the groom. Uh, I agree, as Dr. McGee said in his commentary, I've never seen an ugly bride. They're all beautiful. They're prepared and they are prepared for the groom, for her husband. The groom and everyone, not just, I love to watch the expression on the groom's face when the bride comes, but everybody stands up to see the bride that's been prepared for the wedding ceremony. Like, I believe, Adam in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that God I believe God created man and the animals on the sixth day. And on the sixth day, he brought the animals to Adam to see what he would call them and whatever Adam called them. The Bible says that's what they were called. And But in all his naming of the animals, the Bible says Adam didn't find a helper that was suitable for him. For all the other animals, there was a Mr. and a Mrs. But for him, there was not another one like him. The Bible says that God caused a sleep to fall on Adam and he took a rib, a part of Adam's side, 
and he created a woman for him. And when Adam saw her, he said, this is it. That's the one I've been looking for, the one that is like me, yet different from me, to complete me. This is the one. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. There's finally one suitable for me, and it was one that God had prepared to be suitable for him. And I love the picture of God walking Eve down the aisle. The Bible says that God brought the woman to the man like he had all the other animals to see what he would call her. And he said, this is it. This is the one I've been looking for. This is the one prepared especially for me. And the Bible says we will be prepared to meet him. John says, and I use this verse a lot, but I've never thought of it in quite this context before. The Bible says, look how much, behold, how much God loves us, that we should be called the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, John goes on to say. Now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The New Jerusalem is the place that's prepared for us to be the eternal bride of Christ. We'll be made like him throughout all eternity. The, the one that is suitable to be with Christ is made that way by God as Eve was in the garden. And so we'll also have that city prepared as a bride for the bride, I believe. It will be our dwelling place throughout all eternity. So we see the new creation, the new city, and then thirdly, the new context. It'll be different. We won't be the same. Heaven and earth won't be the same. Our dwelling place won't be the same. Our bodies won't be the same. And best of all, we will live in God's presence. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. When Christ came the first time, John says in his gospel, that he came and set up his tent with us. In the beginning, you remember John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And Jesus, that Word, was the one who created all things. And in verse 14, he says that Word of God the word was made flesh and he pitched his tent. He tabernacled. He dwelt among us, John says, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth. When Jesus came the first time, he dwelt among us. He pitched his tent and that tent was his flesh that he came and he died in the flesh that he might be glorified, and he was glorified and changed. And Paul says in Philippians 3 that one day he's going to change our vile bodies into a body like his glorious body. He came and dwelt among us first so that we might dwell with him forever. When the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem are created, he will put us in a permanent place, I believe, in that John 14 passage that he has gone to prepare for us. So we'll know the presence of God and we'll be the people of God and they shall be his people. Not only will we know his presence, but we'll be his people. And that's what God has promised from the beginning the Bible says that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden. They knew the presence 
of God. They were his people. They had that relationship. Enoch walked with God. I love Enoch. I wish there was more in the Bible about Enoch. Uh, we just have a, a couple of verses in Genesis 5, a couple of verses in Hebrews 11. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. As I heard a story of about a little girl in Sunday school, her mother asked her what they learned in Sunday school, and she said, well, we talked about this man Enoch, and he, he walked with God. And her, his, her mother said, well, what happened? And she said, well, they were out walking one day, and God said, it's closer to my house than it is to yours. So God took him on home with him. He was the people of God because he believed God. That verse in Hebrews 11 goes on to say that without faith, it's, well, before his translation, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. He believed God and he was a person, a man of God. Abraham, we learn later in Genesis chapter 12 through about chapter 25, we learn of Abraham is the friend of God. God says, will I destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and not tell Abraham? My friend, being the people of God, God, the Bible says, spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. To know that we are the people of God. Elijah told Ahab, as the Lord God liveth before whom I stand. And when you're used to standing before God, standing before Ahab is not a big deal. God is calling out, Peter told the council in Acts 15, he explained to the people that the Gentiles were part of God's family just as the Jews were because Peter said God is calling out a people for his name out of those Gentiles. So we will have a new context. We'll know the presence of God. We'll be the people of God and then we will praise God. We hear a lot today about praise and worship and um, I think that's something we ought to do. I think we probably, what we call praise and worship is probably about as far from praising and worshiping God as anything in a lot of context. But in this context, we will worship and praise him for who he is. God will be with us and be our God, verse 3 says we will be able to worship and praise him as we always wanted to hear and couldn't. Paul says, we'll know even as also I am known. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13. The difference between where we are now and where we will be one day is the difference in a baby and an adult. That's how different it will be. Jesus in John, well, 13 through 17, he's the upper room discourse. He's talking to the disciples about what's going to happen and his crucifixion and his leaving them and they don't understand and they keep asking him questions. And Jesus says, I know you're sorrowful now. This is in John 16 verses 22 and 23. But he says, I'll see you again and your heart will rejoice and no man can take that joy from you. And in that day, you won't ask me any questions. You'll know, but now you can pray and ask the Father and he will give you what you need. We won't even ask any questions because we will know him and we will praise him because we know him. We'll praise God because we will know him, we'll understand him, we'll enjoy his presence. We'll, we will be his people and we will praise him. We not only will praise him for what we gain, but we'll praise him for what we lose. The Bible says God will wipe away all our tears. I believe this will be after the judgment seat of Christ when we're judged for what we've done here on this earth and 
I think we will weep for our sorrows of the past, for missed opportunities of the past, for sins, the writer of Hebrews says, that so easily beset us. For all the, as Paul talks about that judgment seat of Christ, for all the wood, hay, and stubble that was burned up before the presence of Christ, before we enter into eternity, we think of all the things that we could have done and didn't. The Bible says that God will wipe away all of our tears before we enter into that eternal state. And then there'll be no more death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that great resurrection chapter, that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And here's where that enemy dies. There'll be no more death when we enter into that new creation, that new city, that new context. Then there'll be no more crying not for sorrows of the past, but it's the guarantee that we won't have any sorrow in the future. There'll be no sin there. There'll be no need for sorrow. We won't cry and be sad for loved ones who have gone and illness and disease and separation. And it will all be new. There won't be any more crying. There won't be any more pain, the pain of separation and of illness and death and broken dreams, and the pain of what might have been, there will be none of that, and we will praise God for what we lose. Because he says the former things are passed away. Isn't that great? The former things are passed away, and he will make all things new. What a change in the book of the Revelation. We've seen judgment and wrath and death and suffering, but now we have something new. A new creation, a new city, and a new context. There is something better coming. Are you prepared for that new day? The only way to be prepared for that, the Bible says, is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. Paul goes on to say in Romans 10 that it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Jew or Gentile, the same Lord over all is rich to all that call upon him and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on him tonight, right now? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Receive him as Lord. Surrender your life to him and look forward to this new creation, this new city, this new era, this new context, a new time, a time that will last forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that there is a new day coming, a new creation, a new city, a new time that will be different and we will praise you and serve you forever because we will know you and we will be made like Jesus. We don't know, as John said, what that's going to be like, but we will be like him. Our vile body will be changed into a new and glorious one like that of Christ. Lord, we thank you for your precious promises through your word. And Lord, we pray that if there is one who is not prepared for that day, that right now would be the time that they would receive you as Lord, surrender their life to you, confess you as Lord, their Lord, and receive you as Savior. We thank you for this time. We pray that you would be honored in it. In Jesus' name, amen.